recording. So today, uh, we are continuing our hands-on presentation of how to build a web application. And, uh, but we're switching a little bit gears. What we've done so far in, in several lectures, we looked at uh, the client side of web applications. And we started by looking at how uh, the browser renders HTML, and that includes CSS for the presentation. So we did that for, uh, for a couple of lectures. Then we looked at JavaScript, and we showed how JavaScript can interact with the HTML and CSS to make the page look more dynamic. But so far, it's all been something within a browser. If you remember all we did, we loaded this HTML file that included some CSS, some HTML, and some JavaScript, and then everything was happening in there. And that's a fine uh, model for very simple applications, but to get the real power of the web today, you need to uh, actually have a backend as well. Uh, so let me ask you, why, why wouldn't it be enough to have these applications run on people's browsers? Why do you need to have this backend? Uh, what, what extra do you, can you get? What extra power can you get over there? Uh, now we can just store data over time, so you can accumulate data rather than it, like resetting every single time they close the browser. Uh, that's, a, that's a very good point. Uh, the backend could be the storage for your data. You don't have to rely on the browser to, so, to uh, save data. And you said when, you, when they close the browser. Let me just uh, clarify this a little bit. Uh, it's true that for the way we wrote the JavaScript application in the browser, the moment you close the page or refresh the page, all that state goes away. But you should know the browser has its own storage, has a little database in there uh, that you could use. Uh, it's called local storage, and you could, in principle, store data there uh, across invocations. And this is how, uh, in fact, many websites store some of your preferences once you visit the website. That's one of the mechanisms. <coughs> Cookies is another storage mechanism. But in general, you want to store data in the in the backend. Uh, I think there was here an article. Yeah. Oh, so backend can actually like hide your uh, confidential like business. Very, very good, very good point. Remember when we when we cheated in the game because we had all the secrets in JavaScript and you can find where the treasure is. Okay, uh, the backend can solve that problem because you can have here secrets that you don't want the client necessarily to know. Although they can indirectly use those uh, secrets. Okay, very good. And in the back there, you have no, that, was it. that was it. Okay, anything else? <coughs> Maybe it allows clients to talk to other clients um, by communicating. That's a very good point. Yes, and I had I hadn't thought of this one. Uh, normally, browsers can directly talk to other browsers. Uh, to, uh, let's say you're playing a multiplayer game in, in two browsers. Okay, they need to talk by way of the backend. Okay, so the backend can serve many uh, many purposes. Now, however, the backend is a very different kind of beast. Uh, it uses different programming languages although not necessarily, but generally. And it has very different kind of uh, considerations for how you build it. On the client side, you don't worry so much about scalability. Because if there are a million users, they'll have a million their own browsers, and each one will run happily. But the million users will all, all go in the back end. Okay? So here you worry about scalability. Here you worry about security. Because while each client can keep their data separate in the browser, the moment you put them in the server, it's very easy for data to kind of uh, leak from one client to another. You have to worry about that. It's also easy for somebody else to come in and steal the data from the back end. It's a lot more profitable to steal it from the back end than from people's browsers because for browsers, you have to do it one at a time. Here, you can steal a lot of data in one, in one go. Okay? So security, scalability uh, are uh, important considerations. And because of this, the back ends are built in a very different way. And one reason we're using a web application in 169 as our vehicle for learning how to program big systems is because it's so uh, varied in scope. I mean, you go from fine-tuning colors for presentation all the way to scaling to a million uh, users at once. So it's a wide spectrum of software engineering. Uh, and in fact, you can't really teach this in, in one semester. You can't hope to learn it all in one semester. Um, we'll learn some in these first few lectures, just very simple applications, 
in the rest of the semesters in your project to do something more involved. But uh, you know, you'll have to wait uh, uh, for actually going in, in real life and seeing websites that run on million users uh, to see what it takes to actually make the backend work on million users. And, and that work is going to be mostly backend kind of architecture work. Okay, so. <clears throat> Uh, I just wanted to bring this slide up uh, to serve us as the background for, for this uh, uh, general discussion. And then we're going to go now to the third part of our hands-on uh, lectures. And I'm going to be following the script that uh, I posted uh, online as well. And you should be able to actually follow this at home as well or even here. It's a little bit more complicated to follow uh, than before because before all we had was the browser. So the moment we loaded the browser, uh, the page in the browser, we could do the HTML, the CSS, the JavaScript, uh, playing around with. Here, we're going to have to run some code um, for the back end and load the browser to see uh, how it interacts. So it's a bit more involved. Are there any questions before we go in and uh, uh, play with this? No? No questions? OK. <coughs> so let me uh, switch gears a little bit here. I'm going to. Um, go now to the terminal. And we start, uh, actually, let me tell you what we're even building. Remember we had this, uh, this uh, extremely interesting game that we couldn't stop playing, where you, uh, uh, you have uh, some treasures randomly placed in there. Uh, you get some parameters for rows, for columns, and some percentage of treasures, and you click. And depending on how lucky you are, how quickly you find it, you get a score. And that, this game was entirely implemented in JavaScript. Uh, and we want to add some backend element to it. And uh, what I've decided to do is to use the backend to provide, if you want, the state to store game history over time and to provide some of the <coughs> intelligence as to what game should be played next. Okay? And this is typical. In, in real life, you want to use the backend for storage, but also for the real smarts of the application. You want to keep it in the backend. So the backend is going to serve two purposes here. When JavaScript starts, when this page is loaded, uh, right now, this version, version 21, uh, has hard-coded four rows, five columns, 30% uh, treasure. Instead, it's going to send a request to the backend and say, give me the game parameters. And the backend is going to send four, five columns, and 30% initially. Once you solve a game, uh, the score will be sent to the backend. And the backend will total the score and will create a new game. We'll send back to the JavaScript the parameters for a new game that's going to be a little bit harder. And uh, for the actual implementation, we're going to increase the number of columns. And we're going to increase this board. Uh, and we're going to decrease the percentage of treasures, so make it harder and harder to find the treasures. So this is that's that's what we're building. We're building this this backend. Um, so I've actually built uh, maybe five versions of the backend, and we're going to go version by version. We're going to run it, see how it behaves. We're going to look at it see what, the, what I've done, but I won't be typing here the actual code for the backend. Um, okay? It's mostly snapshots they are going to get uh, to look at. This is a little bit unlike we've done for CSS and JavaScript, where we could use a debugger and actually type it a little bit on the fly. Uh, so I'll start by running it. So I, I've written this backend in Python. Um, and the first version is version 31, backend-31.py. <coughs> For now, I run it, then we, uh, we use it, and then we look inside to see what's in there. So when you run this backend, uh, there's a little uh, cropping going on there. This is better. So this one, it prints that it's serving at port 1234. So what's happening, I've started a server, uh, an HTTP server, running on my machine. And uh, it's going to run on this port, which means that we will access it at the uh, URL uh, HTTP localhost 1234. Now, if I type this, 
in my browser. Uh, sorry, I played with it before because I was curious how it runs. This is what it does. Okay, here's a question for you, <clears throat> early morning question. What if you type this on your browsers? What are you going to get? You're not going to get anything because localhost is a very special address that each computer resolves to, it, resolves to itself. Okay, so if you do this in your browser, it'll try to go onto your machine. And of course, if you start, if you download it, uh, uh, my tarball with backend 31, if you run it, you get the right thing. But uh, I do want to show you something, though. Uh, let's look up the IP address of my machine. Um, 128. So if you replace this with 128.32.44, dot one seven eight and if you type this in your laptop you'll be actually accessing my website okay uh, so you can do it a little bit but at some point I'll have to yep and see somebody is actually doing this um, or this may actually be the department scanner uh, the department has a continuous scanner scans all the machines on the network the moment they open up ports, they scan for vulnerabilities. Uh, but this actually looks like it's uh, somebody in the audience. <coughs> OK. So uh, okay. So uh, at some point, I'll ask you to stop because we want, uh, I want to see something here in this, uh, in this uh, window. OK, what I'm going to do next is I'm going to sit down. And let's look at uh, what happened when I send this request. I'm going to look again in the browser. And we're going to use our friend, the inspector. You remember it? We used it to inspect the HTML. If you click on elements, you look at the HTML. And here, CSS on the right side. If you click on sources, you look at JavaScript. And there's no JavaScript here to show. And now it's time to look at another feature called the network. Okay? And very briefly, I'll walk you through it, because it's an extremely powerful debugging tool that uh, you will use. So in the network panel, the browser will show all the network requests that it has made. And these come from clicks that you make on the page that will go to request pages, and from JavaScript making requests, like sending a score uh, to the backend. And they are listed here. Um, and you see a summary of them. This is a GET request. Remember, we discussed the HTTP has GET request and POST request. This is the status code. 200 means OK, and, and so on. If you click on it, that's when it becomes more interesting. Um, you can look at the headers of the request. Remember, we discussed HTTP uh, protocol, headers going in the request from the client to the server, and headers from the in the response. So let's look through the headers a little bit. At the bottom, we see the request headers. These are headers that the browser has put in. Uh, for you, and they are communicated to the server. And uh, interesting requests here are um, the user agent, for example. Uh, it's, a, it's a long string that you cannot read. Okay, Mozilla 5.0 Chrome. Okay, this is uh, a convention that browsers out there use to identify themselves. And from the user string, from user agent string, the server can figure out what uh, browser you're using, what version, what operating system, and maybe uh, other things. You can see the version of my Mac OS. And this is how websites collect statistics as to what browsers are being used to access the site. But sometimes, the back end will say, oh, if you're using IE, then I know I need to do something a little bit different for you because of the way I do things. Uh, or if you're using an Xbox uh, or an Android, again, I, I might customize the content for you. Um, OK, so that's in the, in the request. And there are other things as well that we're not going to look at right now. In the response, um, OK, I'm trying to. The response has three headers. The date, uh, obvious. Server is, uh, is something that identifies my web server. And 
this is something that comes by default with the library that I use to build a web server. But the important part that I want to point to you is content type. The server sends you some content, and it sends those characters, hello, there. And this is how it tells the client how to interpret those characters, because the server could be sending an image, or HTML, or CSS, or JavaScript, or, or a movie, or who knows what. And uh, there's a whole set of content types that the server can uh, tell the client. Um, OK. Two more things I want to show you. Are there any questions? And if there are questions, please raise your hand even without me prompting you. Yes? Um, can anyone else not access this Python or backend 31.py? Oh, I can. Can anyone access it? Yes, I can see that people are accessing it here. Somebody would. I mean, like, it says it's forbidden. No, no like Python file. Oh, the Python file? Uh, how exactly I, I, have you downloaded my Python files, or what do you mean to access the file? Um, like on the page where we like follow the lectures. I see. I see. Uh, like this? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but this. Did you download the files that were source like? Um, I'm, I'm not sure why that doesn't um, work, but uh, actually, I can guess why it doesn't work. It works for me, because I'm running it from the uh, local file system. What you're looking at, I uploaded the files to the instructional web server, and the web server, uh, when it sees you accessing uh, the Python file, because it has the executable bit set, uh, it won't give it to you, because it thinks this is actually code, and won't serve you code. I, I suspect this is, uh, this is what's happening for you. But to debug this, you'd have to go look at the web server logs on the instruction machines, which none of us can um, look. But we'll, we'll get into that as we play with our server. Other questions? Yes? Can we hide the user agent information that we sent to the server? Um, can you hide, you as a client, a browser? Yes, you can, in fact, actually. Uh, in fact, uh, if you go here in the inspector, um, I don't remember right now, you can fake the user agent. You can say, send this user agent uh, foo. Uh, and people do that to kind of hide their, uh, their browser. I don't know if it has. Uh, um, actually, we use it at Conviva. Sometimes people doing testing put their name uh, in the user agent. <laughs> And this is how they can find easily the, their requests in the web server logs. Because sometimes the web server receives thousands of requests. You want to see what is mine. And if you fake the user agent with something that you can recognize, uh, yeah, that's a trick that we use. But uh, other than that, I don't know many other uses for it. Let me show you one more thing. Uh, if I press refresh, or this, this uh, icon here, the browser immediately sends the request to the back end. And you can see the request arriving at the back end here and, uh, and doing something. Uh, this is important. It's important to remember that GET requests are thought to be idempotent. It's safe to reissue the request many times. It's also safe to serve the request from a cache. Essentially, don't let it go to the server. So it, it's important, OK? Uh, we'll, we'll get back to this uh, in a bit. And uh, the second thing I want to show you, if you ever want to do debugging, uh, if you look at, uh, um, I'll see. I'm clicking on localhost. I c you can see the headers. You can look at the timing here. The timing panel, the browser tells you how long it took to download this file. And once you start getting to optimize your site, you can look into this and uh, you can see here that the various stages of, uh, of sending a request. This is how long it took to send the request. Well, the requests are just these headers uh, that you say, give me, uh, give me a file. Uh, this is how long the browser waited to get back the first byte of the response. So this is, in some sense, the latency. Uh, this is the time when the request traveled over the network, got to the server, the server started doing its thing and uh, started to respond. First byte arrives here. And this is how long it takes to download 
all the bytes. Okay? So if you see this being long, it means your server has is slow to start responding. Okay? And uh, it's almost a millisecond um, from on the same machine. If you have a lot of content that the server sends back, this may be actually uh, a long time to just get all the bytes. And this means your network is slow in terms of bandwidth. This means the network is slow in terms of latency. It also means the server is slow to actually uh, you know, start up and, and start sending the request. Any, any questions? You won't probably have to do this uh, for your project, but uh, it's something that eventually you'll have to understand how this works under the hood. OK, um, it's time now to look inside the server. And for this, I'm going to be using uh, my uh, Emacs uh, text editor, where I opened the file backend31.py. And I just want to walk you through it just to see how a very simple web server looks like. So first, it's all this. It's, uh, it's all in 29 lines of code, a simple web server. And the reason it's so, so uh, short is because I'm using this built-in Python library. So pretty much any modern language now comes with a library that you can use to build the web server. And the library does pretty much everything for you, except what's very specific uh, for the content you want to have. And for this library, uh, here at the bottom, this is how you start it up. So this is boilerplate code that you actually uh, find on the web. Uh, you choose the port number. You uh, start uh, threading TCP server. It's all this you know, gobbledygook here. Uh, and then you call this HTTP serve forever <coughs> file. And this is a loop. It sits there, waits for request. When a request comes, it does something with the request, sends the response back, and goes back to its loop. And this something that happens uh, around the loop is specified in this handler. And again, this is boilerplate code. Uh, that you just copy from somewhere. But the important part is that the handler allows you to define a function called do get, and the library, the web server, will promise to invoke your library whenever a get request arrives. Okay? And if post request arrives, there'll be another function that will write a little bit later on. So get requests, if you remember from our discussion last time, this is what the browser sends by default. If you type a URL in the URL box, if you click a link. By default, uh, it takes that URL and sends a GET request to the server. So that's the simplest form of a request. What the server does, again, this is very specific to the library that I'm using. Uh, it has to construct a response. And in this library, you construct a response first by calling the send response function, and you give it the uh, status code 200. This means OK. Then you send one or more headers. And here, I'm specifying the header content type, text HTML. I'm telling the browser, I'm going to send you HTML. Or whatever I'm sending you, interpret as HTML. Then, then you uh, call end headers. And then you essentially start writing out to the TCP connection bytes after bytes uh, of the content. And right now, I'm just putting the hello there. So these bytes are going to go back uh, to the client. And the code, this function gets executed for every, for every uh, request I get. And uh, one, one detail, in this library I'm using a threading TCP server, which means that every time somebody sends a request, a new thread gets started, and uh, it's being given the request to handle. And this is how it can handle multiple requests in parallel. But uh, this kind of server is not really meant to serve lots of requests. because it's, it's very slow. You can probably have maybe uh, 10 requests in parallel, or uh, 100 would be at, at most. Okay, So you, you can't get to a million requests per second um, with this kind of sound. But it's perfectly fine for, uh, for playing. Let me show you one thing here. I'm going to change the code to reply content type image JPEG. I'm essentially lying. To the, uh, to the browser saying, I'm going to send you a JPEG image. And instead, I'm sending you these bytes, hello there. Okay. So if I go back to my terminal, stop the server, and then restart it, and then I refresh this page, the same bytes come back to the browser. 
But the browser is being told to interpret it as a JPEG image, which it can't. So it just puts that uh, icon there. Okay, so sometimes you may have to debug this. And you find it by going in, in, into this local host. You look at the headers, and you see, oh, it's a JPEG image. See, the browser doesn't give an error. It just tries to do something uh, for you. Any, any questions? Yes? Um, so when you're sending the HTML, is, are you sending it the actual divs, or are you just sending it the text, and then your browser turns that into the divs? Or like you're sending text. Okay, so we discussed last time that HTTP is a protocol over TCP. TCP transports bytes. Okay, and all that HTTP does, it puts some structure onto the bytes that you're sending. There are a bunch of headers, an empty line, and then whatever. Okay. And it could be, how that is interpreted is based on the content type, and it happens at the browser. Okay, Okay, um, okay so... What does this backend need to do? Right now, it just says, hello there. Uh, just wanted to show you a little bit how HTTP works. The first thing you will have to do, you will have to serve to the browser the, the actual HTML file, which contains the JavaScript and CSS and HTML. Okay? Um, so the way servers do that, essentially, we want to be able to say, slash treasure uh, treasure21.html, that's the actual game. So if I press enter now, well, the browser replies with the same thing. Because uh, the, way we wrote, the way we wrote the server was to reply with hello there no matter what request it gets. So now we have to go into the code and add a conditional there to say, if the request is asking for an actual file that I have on disk, then send it back to the to the uh, client. Questions? I'm going to show you now how we wrote that code. Um, so that's in uh, backend 32. If I start backend 32 and actually reload this page, I'm getting my treasure hunting uh, HTML. The same one that I was loading here from the file system, now I'm loading from the web server. If I look at the trace for the web server, um, we see that it got a request for treasure 21, and then immediately got a request for jQuery. Okay, And the reason is, we send, the browser sends a request for treasure 21. The server sends treasure 21 HTML. The browser starts to parse the HTML. And if you remember, in our game, we use jQuery. One of the first things in the HTML file was a request for the jQuery JavaScript file. So at that point, the browser says, OK, goes back to the server, says, now give me jQuery. So the server gives jQuery, and then give me a CSS file. And the browser starts loading all of the files that actually make up the web page. And this may take a fraction of a second or so, and then the page is being rendered. OK, any questions? No questions? Uh, let's, let's look a little bit at the code. Now the code is going to start to um, so treasure 30, back in 32. I won't be explaining line by line. Uh, I will ask you to actually open this file on your time and, and study it a little bit. But essentially what I've done, I've changed the code in the do get request. And the first thing I'm doing, I'm checking if the request is for an actual file that exists on the server. If the name of the request matches a file, I'm going to give it uh, as a file. It's a little bit insecure uh, that way, but uh, bear with me. So first line is Python code for taking this uh, self.path. This is part of the URL. And adding to that the current directory where the uh, web server runs. This is checking, is this a file? And if it a, it's a file, I have to send it. But before I send it, I have to figure out what type of file it is. Because I have to tell the client, this is HTML, or this is JavaScript, or this is an image. So the way I do that, I wrote here some code to get the extension of the file. And then I have this map. If the extension is .html, then I'm going to use content type text HTML. If it's JS, then application JavaScript. If it's CSS, text uh, slash CSS. And these are standard names 
uh, for content types, which you can look up. Um, and then I'm reading the file, and I send I send all the content of the files to the to the browser. Okay, and you've seen the effect of that. Um, if I go in here, I look at the network requests. Let me. There's a request for treasure HTML, and if you look at the response, you see all the bytes that make up the HTML file, which the server read from a file and then sent it over the network connection. Um, and the browser knows this is an HTML file because there's a header here that says it's HTML. Okay. And the server figured that out by looking at the extension of the file that was being requested. Any questions? Okay, so this is called serving the static assets or static files. Static because these are files that have been put on the server and they don't change until you upgrade the server. Okay, typically HTML files, JavaScript files, CSS files, these are static assets. Our server, as we evolve it, it will also do dynamic content. This is generating new game parameters on the fly based on your state and so on. So typically servers have static content and uh, dynamic content. Very early web servers, it was all static files. So somebody wrote, put on the server, and that's it. Uh, I do want to show you one thing here. And some of these things that I show you, um, I hope you will remember when you run into something similar uh, when debugging. Because otherwise, there's a lot of moving parts here. Browsers, servers, network, TCP, HTTP. And it's hard sometimes to know even how to start figuring out what's wrong. Um, but I will, uh, let's say that I try to ask my server for another file that exists there, uh, backend 32.py. And if I press enter now, notice that the, the browser says no data received. And it's hard to sometimes figure out what, that, uh, what happens, but that's when you open the inspector. And in the inspector, you see the request for backend 32. And uh, you look at the headers, and you see the request headers, but you don't see any response headers. Okay? So something very bad happened. Uh, somebody did not obey the protocol, because HTTP protocol says, if you send the headers, some response has to come back. And the response may say 404, not found, or something you know, decent like that. But here, no response came back whatsoever. This tells me that the fault is somewhere on the server side. So, uh, and luckily, we're running the server on this machine. Um, that's when I can go and look here through my, uh, in the console, I see this exception you know, uh, message here, okay? We can look into what happens. Uh, there's a little bug in my Python code, which the server ran into, and it aborted the whole processing of the request. Didn't even get to send back the headers or anything. So, it just closed the connection. Um, the morale here is that uh, when something happens, you can use the inspector to debug the client side, the client view of the interaction. But uh, at some point, that will point, that will tell you that you need to look in the server for problems, and that's where the server error logs are your friends. Okay? Learn whatever server you run. If you run it on your computer, if you run it in Heroku. Uh, learn how to get to the error logs of the server. One of the first things you need to learn. And in Heroku, there's a line that says Heroku log, and we'll print this for you. But essentially, realize that these logs exist on the server, so you have to somehow go, go get them. So in this case, what happened was that I, I'm asking for an extension .py, and uh, my code is not ready. It doesn't know how to handle Python files, so um, it just aborts. Any questions? How did you uh, get to this? This is my terminal where, where I run the uh, server. You have to type a to no, because if if you, this library that I'm using to run web servers uh, prints on the console uh, all the log. Okay, so this is where the error log is is in the console. In Heroku, it's a lot more sophisticated. The logs are served in some files that Heroku has, and they give you a command to get to them. Okay. Uh, and if you use Nginx, it has its own error logs. Apache, its own error logs. It's something very important to 
uh, learn how to use for debugging. Um, okay, let's take a break, actually. So this is another puzzle that you may want to uh, think about. Um, but while some of you are thinking about that, I want to ask if you have any questions about uh, what's going on in terms of projects. Because there's a lot going on. No questions? Since our communications are uh, very clear. Uh, so let me let me go go over some things. Uh, Make sure you read Piazza, especially the posts from instructors, and especially the ones that have came. Okay? Because if we need to make some changes into forms, into things, that's where it's going to be. Okay? So there's a few of you who have missed deadlines because I guess you're not reading uh, Piazza. Uh, second, uh, we are transitioning to private Git repos. Okay? And it's a little bit. Uh, messy, uh, you're getting a crash course in Git, um, which we're going to look at uh, later. But if you have any issues, uh, let us let us know. But essentially, starting tomorrow, uh, we would like all those GitHub repositories, the public ones, deleted. Okay? So you should be in your private uh, repos. We'll also be stopping using the GitHub pages, uh, because they create more uh, uh, problems than they, they solve, or you cannot branch them. There's only one, so some of you deployed part two on top of part one. Um, but I think everything is fine, but we'll, we'll, we'll send an email, uh, a Piazza post, for how you would delete uh, those uh, GitHub pages. Um, you have three weeks, almost, until you need to uh, submit the requirement document. So there's one thing I learned the hard way being a, a teacher. Um, if you give students a three-week deadline, they'll assume they can ignore it for two weeks. But sometimes uh, it's a three-week deadline because it's a lot of work. And you need three weeks to do it. Okay? It's not because we intend you to forget about it. But we know you are busy, you have many classes, and you tend to be deadline-driven. So to help you out, we created more deadlines. 
Uh, no, it's, seriously, it's only work that you needed to do anyway while just structuring it and planning it a little bit for you. Uh, okay, so uh, you've seen the post that I made in the new uh, page that we're talking about four, uh, four deadlines. One is, uh, it's a simple submission. We need from every team to submit the framework they're going to use. But getting to that information is not simple at all because it requires you to finally meet your teammates uh, and actually find the time to meet, sit down, and have a discussion about what framework you're going to use. And we need to decide this soon because part three of your smile will have to be done that framework. And we need to assign GSIs to your teams uh, based on the framework. Okay? So tomorrow night is a deadline for that information. Please use the form. Even though a week ago we told you to send email, we're trying to move away from email submissions as much as possible. And then uh, you're going to have to start thinking about the actual requirements. It's hard. Okay? You're deciding what to build this semester. And those proposals are not complete specifications. They're just ideas. And in fact, some of the teams may get together and may alter the idea. And that's fine. Okay? But you have to do this. Okay? The more time you spend thinking what you're going to be building, the better experience you're going to have. The more you delay that thinking, the harder it's going to be. Okay? So there's going to be three submissions once a week where we want to see in a Google Doc your thoughts so far. Some very specific issues are there, especially the biggest thing you have to think in addition to what you're building, what worries you? What are the risk factors? Okay. Will we be able to implement this very complex image recognition? Uh, will we have data to actually test this project? Just go there and a laundry list of worries. Getting them up to the surface as early as possible allows us to have visibility into what the issues might be, give you uh, advice. It allows you to actually start maybe finding a solution. Finding a solution may mean solving the problem or avoiding it. Uh, okay, any questions? This is all. Uh, this this one-way communication seems to work perfectly for you. Um, anybody has thought about this? Uh, yes, but I won't repeat your answer because I want more people to think about it. Uh-huh. Yeah, so uh, you two have the right idea. Um, actually, I, I, think, uh, I think I will actually just uh, spell it out at this point because uh, this is a very hacky way of counting how many bits equal to one you have in a number. So imagine that you use numbers to represent uh, sets, bitmap representation. Okay? This is a quick way of counting. And it's quick in the sense that your the trivial way of counting would be for a number that's 64 bits, you do a loop that goes bit by bit, 64 iterations. Okay? This one will only iterate as many times as there are bits of one. It'll, in one step, you'll find the first bit equal to one. Just uh, count it up, and then, and so on. Uh, it's one of those uh, low level uh, tricks that can make some, some codes faster. Okay. Let's, uh, let's switch back to the back end. But before we uh, go on, I do have a, a question. Looking over uh, what I want to teach and how I'm actually teaching it very kind of uh, live some way, um, I realize that this may be too slow. Uh, how many of you think this is going too slowly? Oh, yeah, not so many. Okay. Then I guess it's fine. It's, it's, it's way too slow compared to what I wanted to cover in these many weeks. But if you find this information useful, then, then let's, uh, uh, let's keep going. I do want, though, to get to cover, because uh, this includes some things that you will need for part two uh, of SMILE, and, and, and lots of things for part three. So switching back to, um, to the game, Um, okay, so what, I'm, what, I'm, what I've done so far, I've done a little bit of the web server that uh, sends the, 
the static files. But so far, I haven't built the real smart of the web server. The part that gives the initial game parameters and the part that takes in the score and stores it and computes the game in game parameters. Uh, this brings us into what today's web services are really good at, as opposed to uh, uh, a decade or two ago when all they were doing is serving uh, static files. Dynamic content. So when you do something like this, first you have to step back and think of the interface, as opposed to actually, uh, starting to code right away. So we have to decide how is the browser ask for the initial game parameters, and what will the server respond? So this is a design step. For Smile, we have done this design for you. Uh, and we're do, gonna do something similar here. So we're gonna say that to get the initial game parameters, where you're gonna use a get request, and uh, the URL is gonna be formed like this, slash API, slash game. So why get request? Get requests are the simplest requests which you should use as much as possible whenever it's okay for this request to be sent multiple times. It's like when you're getting a static file, you can send it many times, you're gonna get the same file. Okay? This is different than instructions to delete an account. Okay? You don't want to send that twice or zero times. Uh, so for that, you will use something else. But uh, by default, we will use get requests. And when this, then constructing the URLs, it's, uh, there are some uh, rules, and I'm going to cover them later, perhaps in, in the next lecture. But for now, let's just say that I want to make sure that these URLs are separate from, from the static file URLs, like slash treasure 31. That's interpreted as a file. So I'm going to start with, with slash API to mark that these are all uh, programming interfaces for data. And then I'm going to say, OK, give me a game. So I'm going to put the name game there. And so this is the request. And in response, I'm going to uh, program the server to return data. I need the number of rows, the number of columns, and the fraction of uh, treasure. And we have to decide in what format we'll return this data. In some sense, it's completely up to us because we write the server, we write the client, and we know that HTTP can transfer bytes. So we can come up with any hand, uh, you know, homemade uh, format, but it pays to actually use standard formats. People used XML uh, in the past, but nowadays JSON is very popular. So let me first show you what it is, and then I'll explain a little bit about JSON. So I'm going to send uh, the following bytes. Uh, open brace, number rows, a string, colon, four, comma, number calls, number of columns, comma, five. Okay? So this is exactly the bytes I'm going to send, and I'm going to tell the browser that this is content type application slash JSON. Okay. JSON stands for JavaScript Object Notation. What this is, is simply JavaScript source code to construct a dictionary. This is a little fragment of JavaScript. And, and people have adopted this as one standard for trans transferring data over the web whether or not the data is produced by JavaScript or consumed by JavaScript. We're using the JavaScript notation for objects, essentially. And so this is a dictionary, these are the keys, and these are the values. And everything we learn about JavaScript uh, applies here. You can have arrays, you can have nested objects, and so on. Uh, however, it's a little bit stricter than JavaScript. I uh, remember that when we did JavaScript, we saw that you can use uh, single quote strings or double quote strings in JavaScript. In JSON, it's only double quote strings. And also in JavaScript, you don't have to put these quotes. If you just write number of rows, colon four, the JavaScript interpreter will forgive you and will fill it in. Okay? Uh, no such uh, flexibility for JSON because JSON is meant to be, it's a stricter format because it's meant to be used across many languages. So it has tighter parameters. Uh, okay, so this is uh, uh, the plan for the initial game parameters. 
And this is programmed in backend 33, which I'm gonna I'm gonna stop, kill this backend here, and start the backend 33. And for now, I'm just gonna show how it operates, and then we see how it's written. So as I described above, if I type in slash API slash game, by default the browser will send a get request. And look what comes back. It's exactly what I wanted. And if you look here in the inspector, you can see that it comes with a content type application JSON, which allows the browser to interpret it as JSON. So these are the bytes at the top. But if you look at preview, this preview pane here, it will very nicely parse it and present it to you as an object the same way as deb the debugger shows objects. So this is actually very handy for inspecting uh, uh, JSON. Any, any questions? No? Okay. So then let's look at the code for this in the browser, in the backend. This is the 33 we said. So the top of the file is the same as before. All this mess is for serving static files. This is what's new. So notice I added a conditional. If uh, I'm requesting slash API slash game, I'm writing, this is Python code, okay? Don't, it's easy to be confused because it looks a little bit like uh, JavaScript. But I'm constructing an object, a dictionary in uh, Python. And then I'm sending the response code 200. I'm sending the content type application JSON. And this is json.dumpS. This is Python library for serializing uh, objects into JSON format. So this this library will take a Python object, array, number, string, dictionaries, and will turn it into that string in JSON format. And every decent programming language has a library like this for producing JSON strings and for taking JSON strings and creating internal objects. Um, in our case, the client is written in JavaScript. So it's easy for you to confuse the JSON notation with the client. But generally, JSON notation can be used with any pair of languages. Okay? It, that's, how, that's how Android consumes data, and it's written in Java. And that's how iOS con consumes data, it's written in Objective-C. Each one has its own JavaScript library. Um, OK, so uh, so far, I built the backend to serve the initial game parameters. Now we have to switch uh, our hats and put the uh, front-end developers' hats back on because we want to change the game instead of having hard-coded uh, parameters to get these parameters from the, from the backend. Okay? So I'm going to be now editing JavaScript. Um, let, me, uh, let me first run it for you. So uh, treasure. 30, um, 33. So far, we've been using Treasure 21. That's a standalone JavaScript game. Treasure 33 is uh, a new uh, version uh, of the game that is trying to get the parameters from the backend. And we see that it doesn't quite uh, do it because it hasn't filled in uh, that stuff. Let's look at uh, what's in there, and then you'll see why it's not finished yet. Uh, okay, so this may be a bit of a switch for you, uh, but this is this is going to be your life as web developers. You'll be programming in JavaScript for the client a little bit. Then switch to the back end and, and, and look at the inspector in between and so on. So um, this is the code that we had from before. And I'm going to just scroll to the end where I made the change. And this is where the change is. And if you remember, in our JavaScript code, we used this document.ready to initialize the game. And what we used to have here was to create a treasure map with four rows, five columns, 30% treasure, and render. That's how the game uh, started. And then the game took it from there by watching the clicks on the buttons. So what I've done instead, I've written some JavaScript code. Can you read this? Yeah. OK. Uh, dollar sign. What does dollar sign 
tell you in JavaScript, jQuery. So I'm using jQuery to make a request to the server. And the way you do that in jQuery is $.ajax. It feels like a very uh, obscure notation, but it's actually fairly simple. Dollar sign, it's the name of a variable. It's a jQuery library. Dot is how we access a method of that library. So the jQuery <coughs> library has a method called ajax and takes a, a dictionary with lots of uh, um, parameters. But the two that are most important are the URL. It tells it <coughs> what URL to send. And because I don't put the HTTP part, it's going to send the request to the same server from where the, the, this HTML file was loaded. Let me say that again. This JavaScript runs in the context of an HTML document. Okay? By default, if you make requests without putting the HTTP part, the request will go to the same server that provided the HTML. So this HTML is, uh, was loaded from localhost 1234, so the requests go to 1234. This is important. It's the request, it's the server from which the HTML came not from which the JavaScript came. And the reason this is important is because typical HTML pages, uh, let's say CNN.com serves the HTML page and loads libraries from Google, from uh, jQuery, from a lot of other library providers. So the JavaScript code can come from many sources. But all that code runs in the context of CNN.com because CNN.com is the page, uh, it's the domain for the, for the actual page. So therefore, all requests will be interpreted as cnn.com. This is, we'll, we'll get back to this when we discuss security uh, issues. So what this does says, uh, this is the URL, and this is how you tell uh, jQuery what to do when the request comes. And hopefully, if we have time, we'll get to discuss more about, uh, more about this. This is a special style of programming called asynchronous programming. And it's a little bit confusing because uh, the code execution, I mean, it starts from Ajax, makes a request, and then jumps suddenly deep in here. Okay? But um, just bear with me. So for now, what happens is a request will get made. The request goes back to the server. The server does its stuff. It responds with this JSON. And when the response comes back to the JavaScript, this function will be invoked, and this parameter response will be set to the actual uh, response. Okay? And all I'm doing it for now, I'm logging it. That's why it's not shown render on the page, because I'm not actually processing the response from the server. So if I go back, and actually if I scroll down, you will see in the console, indeed, the logged the logged response. And I can go also in the inspector, uh, look at network. It's kind of hard. Um, if I click on the game, I see, I see the re request. So the request comes. It's just I'm not doing enough uh, with it. Uh, I just wanted to show you the mechanics of making a request. And next, uh, if we, I have a version 34 of Treasure which is a small extension that actually uh, renders the page. And if you want to look at the code, all it does, on top of what we've done so far, here uh, I've changed the success function. Not only do I log it, but I construct a new treasure map and I render it. And notice how I'm picking the number of rows from the response. This is why the front end is going to render the map using the parameters provided by the server. And the response is a JSON object. If you use JSON in, with jQuery, it will automatically parse the JSON string and give you a nice object that you can access like this. Okay? In other languages, you have to actually invoke a library explicitly to do that parsing. But here, it's all done. Okay, any questions? Okay, so I showed you how to make an Ajax response, an Ajax request, and how to specify how to, what to do with the response. 
Okay? There, were, there was a question on Piazza uh, late last night. Um, and the question was about the smile project, saying, how we have this function make get request. And if you look in that function, all it does is it does one of these Ajax calls. And somebody said, this make request doesn't return anything. So how am I going to get the response and do work with it? The way you do that is you pass in a function uh, in, in this success parameter. And the function will be invoked when the re response is ready. And the function will get to work with the response. Okay? And we actually wrote the, some stubs for this, your function. They're called on success and on failure. There are many more parameters that Ajax can, can take. Um, OK, so we've done. Now, the backend can serve static files. The backend can, can supply the initial game uh, parameters. I want to now change the backend to update the score. So that's the third feature, the backend. So we go back to the drawing board. And let me stress again uh, the different hats I'm putting on. So I have my front-end developer hat, which actually is two little hats. One is the design, CSS, and the other is the JavaScript, the functionality. I have my back-end developer hat, where I write uh, Python, I deal with web servers, and all sorts of stuff. And then I also have the designer hat. And this is the hat that you actually have to start uh, wearing first. Um, so in the design, I'm actually designing the interface. And once you design this interface and you write it down, then you can have two teams start working in parallel. The front-end team writes JavaScript consuming this design. The back-end team writes Python or Ruby to produce this design. Okay? And that's why we're going to be very picky to see from you in your projects that you do this in your design documents. And because we believe that that's what will enable you to parallelize work to split teams. So how are we going to deal with new score? Well, what needs to happen? JavaScript has a new score, and it has to tell the backend, here's the score. Give me new game parameters. Okay, So this can be done with one request and a response. In the request, you send the score. And in the response, you're going to get back the game parameters. First, what kind of request can this be? This should not be a GET request. GET requests are for things that do not change state. You can have them many times, and they won't do anything different. Uh, sending a score changes a state, updates a total score in the back in the back end. Okay, so because uh, this changes the state, we're going to use a POST request. It's a convention, and we're going to we get to design these things. And uh, just I'm going to start it with API for symmetry. I'm going to say this belongs to the game. Because typically, our APIs will deal with uh, many things. Like you have, uh, in a, in a sh shopping cart, you have carts, you have items, you have prices, you have all sorts of things they may deal with. And uh, I'm going to say that this is a new score. So I invented this URL. And I'm going to say that in request, I'm going to send in JSON the score. Let's say four. And in response, the, the same thing as before. Because conveniently, all I need in both of these responses is the game parameters for the new game. Okay? This is not generally the case. Every request has its own uh, data that gets sent in the request to the server and response from the server. Any questions? Okay. So notice that POST requests often send data and receive data. GET requests, they, all they send is the URL. They get uh, data back. OK, so uh, first, uh, we'll just run, run the backend that implements this. Then we uh, look at it. This is in backend 35. <clears throat> and. Uh, now, like we've done before, we run the backend and we want to test it to make sure it does what it wants. And then we put our uh, uh, hat on to develop uh, JavaScript. The problem we have in terms of debugging, and this is another one of those take-home uh, tricks.
for you. You can debug GET requests all with the browser because you type them in the URL and the browser will make a GET request. You look at the inspector to see what happened. You cannot easily make POST requests with the browser unless you install a plugin or something. Um, you, you can do them from JavaScript, but not so by simply typing the URL. So I want to teach you another, uh, another tool now that's really, really handy. Uh, so I'm in another window, a tool called curl. Okay, so if you use uh, Linux or a Mac, it's pre-installed. If you use Windows, you can download curl. Another, another alternative is wget. Curl uh, makes uh, HTTP requests. So let me show you. I'll sit down a little bit. You type in a URL, localhost, one, two, three, four, and it prints hello there. Okay, so it plays the role of a browser, makes requests and shows you the responses. API game, it shows you the, the JSON. And it becomes really handy when you pass the dash V parameter, means verbose, because it prints, uh, it makes a connection. This, these are the outgoing headers, and this is the incoming response headers. So you can use curl from the command line to debug headers, communication. And curl really shines when you want to do post request. Okay, and the way you do that, capital X post, this means make a post request. And then you have to specify what data you are sending, dash D. And now I'm going to write the JSON string. Score colon four. So this is simply in the shell I typed in this string. So what curl is going to do, it's going to make a post request to this URL. It's going to add uh, some uh, headers there by default, like user agent curl and so on. And it's going to send this data as, as JSON. And I think this is with the dash V. So let's see what happened. This is what curl sent out. Notice the post request. Notice the URL. Um, notice that, well, actually here it didn't quite get it right. Um, the content type should have been JSON, but we forgot to tell curl to tell the server that is sending JSON. However, it said, I'm sending you 13 bytes, and it sent the bytes. And here's what it got back. It got some JSON, and this is what the server sent back. And notice that the number of columns now is six. And the treasure is 24%. So this server, and I didn't show you the source code, it's working. It's increasing the game board, and it's uh, making it harder. And if I send more and more requests, the number of columns keeps growing, and the fraction of treasure keeps going down. OK? And now if I go here and refresh the page, notice that it's getting the it's, it, it asks the server, give me, a, give me the current game. And the server says, well, this is the current game. What we see here is one server serving two clients. One was the web browser, one was curl. The web browser says, give me a game. Curl said, here's a new score, here's a new score. And because they share the state, which is by design in this case, you, they get to cooperate in some way. They, they get to communicate in some way. Okay? You may want this, or you may want to have the different clients use their own games. That's all something that we can do uh, later. Questions? Okay. Um, so, uh, okay, well, this is, I wanted to play this game. Um, but actually, let's go to game 35, because... No, sorry, I, uh, I'm jumping ahead of myself. I need to show you the, the code uh, for the backend 35. So remember before we had this thing uh, here that was sending the initial game parameters? Uh, I create, I've added this uh, function, game, game, game parameters, which I wrote here at the top. And um, so... Essentially, I'm writing a, a few global variables to keep the, store, the, state, the state of the game. And uh, 
get game parameters, packages all those in a dictionary to be sent uh, in JSON. And I'm using I'm using get get parameters when I get the initial game parameters, and I'm also using it here in the post request. Now, post requests are harder to make and harder to process. And one reason they are harder is because in a get request, most often all you get is the URL. You don't get data from the browser. Post request sends data. So the first thing we need to do, we need to unpack this data. And uh, I've done it here kind of the hard way. First, you go to the content length header that comes from the browser, says how many bytes do I have? And in our case, it's going to be, I forgot, 13, I think. Then you read those bytes. And this is a string, which I'm going to be printing, receive data string. And then I know that if everything is uh, uh, OK, this is JSON. So I call this JSON loads, load s function, to convert my string into a Python object. In JavaScript, you don't have to do this because jQuery does it for you. It looks at the string and figures out if it should convert it to an object. But in Python, in, in Objective-C, you have to explicitly uh, convert the string to the object using the JSON uh, parts of it. Then I have this portion of the code that manipulates the state of the game. It increases the number of games by one, increases the number of columns by one, uh, computes fraction treasure to be 80% of what it was before, so it decreases the fraction treasure. It updates the total score, and then it produces the response uh, using the same get game params, uh, which now will see the updated game state and sends application JSON. Okay? So this is essentially how web servers work. Uh, they wait for these requests. They look at the URL to decide what to do. And typically, they have a long list of uh, URLs that they handle. They process the incoming request to extract the data. They update the state of the server. And then they produce the response. Now, this web server that I show you here um, is, uh, is written from a very simple library because I wanted you to see what happens under the hood. And it's not even all that happens under the hood, like HTTP specific processing, the TCP connections, that's still hidden uh, from us. But at least we see all the parts of processing the request. In practice, you don't write web servers like this. You use frameworks like Rails and Django. And those frameworks come with a lot of facilities for helping you with this. For example, they will do this for you. You just have to specify the content type and the actual content. Okay, they'll do this, all this stuff for you, and more. They'll do this parsing of the request for you. You don't have to worry about parsing content length, converting into integers. And for this, they'll help you a lot doing it right. Um, we're going to, uh, at the end of today's lecture, we're going to pick up from here next time to do two very important and interesting things. One, uh, how do you manage game state? Okay? This is not, you cannot write the web servers like this with global variables for, for many, many reasons. So that's why you use databases to store the state. So we're going to do that at the beginning of next lecture. And the other thing we're going to do, we're going to look at JavaScript, how this AJAX works, and especially the uh, asynchronous programming uh, part of AJAX. Okay, so that's it for today. Uh, we're waiting for your two submissions, one tonight. Um, Actually, tonight you have to finish the GitHub transition to uh, private repos. And we're going to check tomorrow to make sure that there are no more public uh, repos out there. And tomorrow night you have to tell us the framework.